afternoon, good evening, good night. Because there are people from all over the world and in different time zones. We've got people from Colombia, from Ecuador, from Angola, from Turkey, from Greece, from 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 Austria, from Germany, from Romania. Lots of people from Romania. I'm sure there was someone else. Like, where was the other place? Can't remember. Oh, yes, Mexico. But as I get them was... Toda la población mexicana con nosotros. Um, but that's, it's just wonderful. It's wonderful to see so many people. It's an absolute, an absolute uh, uh, privilege for me. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming to this uh, session. And yes, obviously, because those of you who know my history know that Mexico is, is super special for me. And it's lovely to see so many people from all over Mexico, from Chiapas and and Baja and Chihuahua and and uh, and, and fin. It's just wonderful. And um, uh, and, and Turkey uh, and everywhere. Yeah, it's lovely. Anyway, listen. Uh, before I start, I just want to uh, say a massive thank you to to the team from Lucy and the team at uh, Helbling for organising these webinars. Um, I don't know about the rest of you who are here, but I've watched the others they've had so far. Fantastic webinars um, full of incredible content and I believe you can still uh, watch recordings of those of those fabulous webinars and I would like to recommend them to you but uh, Helbling thank you so much for organizing these webinars and more than anything else thank you for inviting me um, and once again you are all very very welcome so let's get started let's get started here we go uh, now um, here are some of the words and the terms we're going to be talking about during this session. Uh, and um, don't worry if they don't mean anything to you yet. I hope that by the end of the talk they will, otherwise I won't have done my job. So first and foremost, I suppose, here in this list is content. And that's very easy. It's the topic, the subject, the things we're talking about, uh, the things students are reading about and so on and so forth. Uh, then there's this concept of deep processing. What does it mean? What's that all about? Well, that's something I want to talk about in a minute. Then I want to talk about root and branch. Uh, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that in terms of language learning and harvesting. How do you harvest language? We'll talk about that. And interactions. Well, that's pretty clear cut. Uh, uh, and um, we'll talk about focused language practice as well. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, uh, and um, so for the last time, and I'll probably say something about it at the end, it's an absolute thrill to see so many people popping up uh, in the chat box from so many different places around the world. Uh, and, and you are all very, very welcome to this session. So uh, the first question I have for you uh, um, this morning this afternoon, this evening, tonight. Oh, sorry, I'm really enjoying myself. Uh, the first question I have for you um, is this. Where do students get language from? What are the sources of language for students of English as a foreign or second language? Oh, I forgot to mention Brazil, of course, and I'm sure I forgot to mention other countries. Um, school, games, media, uh, music, internet, songs, people, film, video, home, uh, songs, uh, uh, YouTube, exposure to real content from school, from the teacher, from such. Uh, I'm trying to read this. It's 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 doing my head in. My brain's going crazy. Ah, <laughs> but but yes, I I I kind of I kind of uh, I kind of get all that, um, uh, and um, uh, I've tried to summarize some of the things you're saying from listening, from games, from 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 teachers, from TikTok. Yeah, absolutely from social media, from podcasts, from music, from books, music, TV, native speakers. Well, yeah, that may be and all. all. So I've tried to sort of summarize all those in four broad categories. Uh, so, of course, as many of you mentioned, uh, students get their English from their teacher. Well, let's face it, uh, that's where they're going to hear most English. If they're working in an environment where there isn't English in the world all around the classroom, it's the teacher's English that's going to be the most present in their lives. And that's why many, many uh, students will end up pretty much speaking very much like their teacher, because that's the model of English that they are faced with every single day. Uh, and, um, and, and 
and it's not just the the English that teaches uh, uh, that we give students when we teach them grammar, the present simple or the third conditional or vocabulary, that kind of thing. It's also the other language we give them, which is just as important, the language of classroom management, uh, the language of, oh, hello, how are you? Oh, how's your mother? Or did you have a nice weekend? What have you been doing? That kind of thing. So uh, that's one source of language for students. Um, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, another source for me is, of course, the materials, uh, the language presentation, the texts in their course book, uh, the grammar exercises, the, the, the dialogues, the, well, all the stuff they get in their materials, which the teacher uh, sort of leads them through. Uh, uh, and, of course, that's where students get English from. Um, and we'll talk about the value of that in a minute. Where else do they get it from? Well, uh, they get it from people we know, from real-life interactions. Uh, someone said uh, earlier on, that I, I saw the, the, the term native speaker flashing up. Well, yes, it might be a native speaker, but increasingly in the world we live in, it's almost impossible to say who is a native speaker. And there are so many, many, many more people who speak English as a second language just as efficiently and communicatively and well as people who were born with English, like me, that, that the distinction is beginning to, in my opinion, but you don't have to agree with me, is beginning to kind of fade away. And most of my good friends in English language teaching, English language publishing, um, we all speak pretty good English. Uh, um, we may have slightly different accents and come from different places, but it's not so much that. It's, it's the real life interactions we, we, uh, we have. And anyone who's learned a foreign language, which is probably most of you, most of us, knows what it's like, those real life interactions. Uh, so, for example, uh, living in Mexico as a young man with no uh, um, uh, um, Spanish, some of the most powerful learning experiences for me were when I had when I went to the farmacia or the super or the or maybe not the supermercado so much, but the you know maybe the dry cleaner or or when I went to um, the taller to get my car fixed or something like that. You have to you have to interact in the language you're learning in Spanish. Help, help! I don't understand. So you fight to understand. You listened. You really listen to what people are saying to you, and your brain tries to process what you're hearing and work out what it means. Help! What did he just say? And 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 gradually, as you spend more time in my great good fortunate life spend more time in Mexico the bits begin to sort of make sense and separate and come together and you um, and those interactions were terribly powerful for me uh, as a as a as a as a learner of Spanish and it's exactly the same for learners of English um, interactions real interactions whether it's with teachers classmates uh, um, uh, um, people that they meet I was going to say on the street, but you know what I mean. Uh, that those are all terribly important, uh, um, uh, and um, uh, and and so on. Um, and uh, and finally, um, uh, of course, something that all of you have been talking about in, in those that sort of blizzard of of, of wonderful suggestions uh, that we had in the chat box. Things like TikTok, all the social media, like like YouTube, like podcasts, like like blogs, like 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 um, English language journalism, like English language movies or, or, or TV programs or, 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 or songs or whatever it is. Wow, there's just a richness of, of, uh, of English available at the touch of your mm, mouse or whatever it is, or, or at the touch of your um, phone, um, your, your little finger on your phone. Um, and, um, and, those, if you like, are my kind of four general areas. Uh, I hope I haven't missed any out, but I hope that they include, uh, they kind of are sort of overarching uh, terms and categories for most of the things that you've said. But here's my next question. <coughs> of these four, of these four, which do you think is the most effective way of getting uh, English. Which is the most effective way of 
receiving English. The teacher, three, 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 four. One, four, three, 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 four, 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 three, one, two. It, it, it's all of them. Um, all of them. Uh, three, four, um, one. This is exhausting just watching the chat box. <laughs> um, but yes. Uh, um, uh, now look, this is this is uh, uh, lots of people say three, but that's it's not a it's not there's not complete agreement amongst you, and I understand that entirely. And someone said it depends on the on the I missed what it was. I think it maybe depends on the situation or what's going on or something like that. Well, look, I'm going to suggest what, what I, how I think which the most effective are you don't have to agree with me but this isn't i'm not giving you evidential fact i'm not giving you um, um the law or or the or the law of the prophets or anything uh, but in my in my understanding of it what i believe is that if you look at what i've just put up on the screen uh the um, someone mentioned dialogic interaction and uh, uh julieta um or julieta i'm not quite sure um and uh Yes, I mean, I, that, that's for me, if you look at what the darker the blue, in my opinion, the more profoundly effective uh, these sources of information are. Uh, and, and, um, and I wonder whether those real life interactions uh, are, are, um, are um, the absolute sort of gold dust, the, the jewels. Uh, uh, and of course, that's why we always say, if you're lucky enough, if you want to learn uh, Spanish to to end up in a, in a, in a village somewhere in a Spanish speaking country uh, where no one speaks English. Well, wow, you know that you you're going to learn Spanish unless you really really fight against it. And the same is if you can <clears throat> go to there are, there are some parts of of Britain agricultural communities. Oh, well, anyway, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting too detailed the greatest thing you can do is live in an English speaking community and have interactions with people. It sort of English happens to you. Um, but it doesn't have to be that you can also have interactions with all sorts with all sorts of people online, you can have interactions with people um, all around you. And as I said, even in the classroom or with other students and with teachers and so on and so forth. Uh, my second most effective thing is something that so many of you identified about five minutes ago and that's the whole issue of of what you hear and see the social media the things you read the things you hear uh, the things you like and of course and we'll return to this point again and again and again if you hear and see things that you're really interested in you're really motivated in um, by motiva interested in and motivated by wow that is so powerful because your reception of what of the language that you're hearing and seeing is is really really powerful because it, it comes to the heart and the head at the same time and you'll see me doing this and that uh, often does that mean that i don't think those other two sources are important no of course that i don't uh, the the teacher and the materials they we use um, they're absolutely vital for students in a classroom setting learning English. Why? Well, because, and this is the only one I can think of, one of the great things that uh, teachers do and materials specifically designed for language learners do is to disambiguate the language which students are receiving. Because anyone who's ever learned a language knows that particularly at lower levels, it's like trying to get through undergrowth. You can't see where you're going. The, the leaves, the trees are too tall. You're completely, and you do the best you can, and, and you, you sort of do it a leaf at a time, or if you like. Um, and my metaphor is not very good, but... Um, but uh, and, and those kind of materials uh, can, can show you a path through that undergrowth, um, and they're vitally important. Um, and of course, uh, the teacher is also uh, uh, important because it's my teacher. If my teacher cares for me, and I hope she does, because that's what being a good teacher is partly all about. Um, if she cares for me, she will help me to find my way, to find my path through the forest and so on and so forth. So um, let's go to another question. 
uh, um, uh, um, oh look there's there's someone uh, Svetlana a Ukrainian who went to uh, Mexico and, and is now um, of course they're now Spanish geniuses um, Spanish speaking geniuses anyway um, so so what do students learn from well they learn from texts of all kinds from people of all kinds from their interactions and from themselves and the focused language practice they do uh, um, yes uh, by the way uh, Monica Magdaleno says uh, kids are a different chapter the, uh, the, uh, what I'm saying what I'm talking about today is is very much um, not age specific in any way and of course if we were talking about teaching children in particular uh, we might have a slightly different conversation but the points I'm going to make now I think apply just as much to children as they do to 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 teenagers and adults and so on and so forth I've got a, a, something else which really interests me and this is if you like the heart of of uh, uh, of what we want to talk what I want to talk about today is is why do students uh, learn why do students learn effectively they learn because of what what is it that makes them learn I don't mean makes oh um, needs motivation the need to communicate I'm reading again uh, um, motivation curiosity that's my favorite word in education need pleasure yeah thank you yes motivated um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, to understand um, their needs, their um, purpose. That's it. What, what do they want to do it for? Passion for, for, for learning. To pass the school year. Good. We'll talk about that as we go on. Needs, curiosity. Be part of a group for better opportunities. That kind of um, extrinsic motivation. For necessity. Sorry, instrumental motivation. To get a job, to travel. All of those things are, are important. But I want to suggest that students learn because of three special things. Three special things. And the first is deep processing. Deep processing. By the way, motivation comes into this here big time. What on earth do I mean by deep processing? What does it mean? Let me explain. Uh, this year, uh, 2021, I... Um, I, I read on the recommendation of a good friend and colleague of mine, I, I read uh, this book. It's called uh, Stephen M. Coslin. It's called Active Learning Online. And now he's a psychology professor. He's been the psychology professor for as, probably about as long as I've been uh, a, 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 an English language teacher and writer, which is like oh, forever. Um, so, and, and his book was very interesting. And I'm going to show you... Uh, something he did, those words in, in that little box. So let's have a look at those words. So he, every time he meets a new crowd of students, they're all there in the lecture theatre in their rows, and he divides them uh, into pairs. Uh, one, uh, one student is A in each pair and one student is B. You know, we've, we've all done that a million times in our lives. And he says, I want all the A students to look at this list of words and they must decide which of the words are taller at the beginning than they are at the end. Which of the words are taller at the beginning than they are at the end. And I want all the B students to look at all these words and say, which of these words describes something that's alive? Which of these words describe something that's alive? And after 20 seconds, um, uh, um, um, it's the palapa. How you love it? Sorry, I just saw a message. I got distracted. Um, um, uh, hello, uh, Gerardo. Uh, um, uh, so, um, remember, because I distracted myself and I might have distracted you. A students, which words are taller at the beginning than at the end? Uh, B students, which words describe uh, something that's alive? And after 20 seconds and with no warning, and to the students' outrage, he said, right, I want you quickly to see how many words you can remember. You know, uh, uh, he, he takes the words away, say, how many can you remember? And then the A students and the B students compare how many they can remember. And every single time that he's done this, and he continues to do this, 
or India, sorry, must stop speaking Spanish, uh, today in 2021. Every time he does this, the B students remember more words than the A students. The B students remember more words than the A students. And why is that? Well, because the A students are being asked to do something which is more or less interesting, but actually less. It's not very profound. They just have to identify that frog has a bigger letter at the beginning of the word than at the end. So does lamp. So does forge and brick and hug and bear and deer. Whereas rat and ape and stone and, and snail and chair don't. They're the same height all the way along the line. But the B students have to think more profoundly. They have to process more deeply. They have to use their heart and their head, their emotional and their cognitive uh, abilities. They have to function emotionally and cognitively to give value, to give a deep value to uh, these words. Whereas the A people don't have to give any deep value at all. And that's an example of deep processing. Let me give you another example. Now, I'm terribly grateful to the person who told me about this because I got to watch a little video on YouTube. It's about five minutes. And as you'll see from that slide, the video is called How to Get the Most Out of Studying. And the one I'm going to talk about is part two of the five little videos that are there, given by a psychology professor called Stephen Chu at the University of Samford in the United States. And it's not Stanford, it's Samford. And he, um, he has his undergraduates in front of him and he starts his uh, lecture course by talking a little bit about how people learn. And to my surprise, he quotes a piece of research from 1969. Good God, most of us weren't up. Well, I was alive. I'd been a, I was probably about 100 years old in 1969. But, you know, it's a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and and um, this was an experiment that was done then. But, but it makes the same point. The subjects of this experiment were all given a list of words. And they were separated into four groups, A, B, C, D. In the A group, uh, they were told, uh, just have a look at these words. Nothing else. The B group were told, have a look at these words. And in three minutes, uh, five minutes or something, you're going to have a test to see how many you can remember. The C group were told, have a look at these words and find out how many of them have the letter I in them, I in them. And the D group were told to have a look at these words uh, and, and just say which ones they liked, which ones they liked. You've probably guessed the punchline to this experiment. In scientific terms, the result. <laughs> um, uh, you, you've probably guessed. But the thing that surprised me most, by the way, was that there was absolutely no difference amongst the people who were told they were going to be tested and the people who, who weren't told anything. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the B group who were told they were going to be tested didn't seem to have much effect. But of course, as uh, uh, Katha uh, there says, um, and, 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 and Philip and, and, um, and so on say there, of course, it was the D group who remembered most. Why? Because they just had to decide which words they liked. And the moment they were asked that, they started processing emotionally and cognitively, heart and head. That's deep processing. Deep processing where uh, uh, um, Javier says it's meaningful learning. And, and I, uh, yes, but I, would, I want to go further than meaningful. I'm talking about the emotional connection and the cognitive connection. I'm asking my dear students for your full attention, but I want your heart as well as your head. But your heart on its own ain't, ain't good enough for me. I want your head as well as your heart, both of them together. And when you get both of them together, that is deep processing. And that's my first reason that students uh, learn because of deep processing. And they don't necessarily learn 
through shallow processing. Because if we haven't got their heart as well as their head, then they're not really there. They're not really with us. OK, so that's the first of my three things. Here's the uh, and that means um, uh, which means what? Well, let me tell you about deep processing in the context of the times we've all been living through. And I know, of course, we all know, depending on which country you come from, that we've all had a bit of a rubbish 14, 15 months recently. Uh, the way that different governments and different countries have dealt with COVID-19 has been, has been well, interesting and varied. Uh, but everyone, everyone has suffered the, the lockdowns, the difficulties, the illness and, and the death and the sadness and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, I'm the most, I'm the luckiest man in, in the world. Touch wood, so far in my long life, I've never lived through a war or a revolution or famine or any of the other dreadful things that happen. So that for me, the pandemic is, is, is the kind of most alarming and uh, worst thing that I've ever lived through. And it's been rubbish. Uh, yeah, rubbish. But some things have given me massive hope. Uh, it's partly the dedication and the love and the care of, of people, our health professionals, uh, some of our, the public services in my country and in countries around the world, and the way that, that people have shown an immense humanity towards each other, and a kindness and, and a care. And that's been completely uh, awe-inspiring. But there's another group of teachers that I know, if you like, more about. And here's a whole lot of people who are cheering them. And they're cheering. And who are they teach? Who are they cheering? I'll tell you who they're cheering. They're cheering teachers. They're cheering teachers. Why? Because in this pandemic, suddenly, many, many teachers who weren't at all used to teaching online were suddenly thrust into this alien world of having to teach with Zoom and, and Teams and, and, and all sorts of other weird programs on computers and phones and what And I have seen teachers rise magnificently to that challenge. I mean, just awe-inspiring with creativity, with love, with care, with imagination. Uh, so, so that the, 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 way, they've, the way they've learnt in almost no time at all. They've learned about, about breakout rooms, about chat boxes, about sharing screens, about all these technical things, but not just that. Uh, I've been so moved by the way that some teachers have come through with, with new ideas and new ways of engaging students and trying to get them to process deeply, all that kind of thing. It's been awe-inspiring. And I'm sure you're, you're one of those teachers and you know other people who've done that. It's just extraordinary. And the teachers I've talked to and worked with during this, the, this, this pandemic, wow, what an incredible group of human beings and how lucky their students are to have them in impossible situations because some, not all students have access to, oh, we're not going to spend all of our time talking about that. There are different forums for that. But a good teacher of the kind I've just been mentioning, a good teacher uh, is, is the one who's able to provoke deep processing. A good teacher is someone who brings students' hearts. And, and, uh, and someone said, um, uh, yes, uh, by the way, Claudia, Claudia uh, uh, um, um, there says, um, students and parents, I think that's a really important point which we forget sometimes that parents um, have been absolutely vital and where online learning has been really effective, the contribution of engaged and conscientious and loving parents has been absolutely, uh, absolutely fundamental. And of course, teachers, of course, uh, teachers um, are not always terribly polite about the parents they have to deal with, in my experience. Um, but it's worth shouting out with admiration for those parents who've who've supported their children and their teachers so well. Anyway, uh, um, 
Um, and someone, I saw someone uh, uh, mention the word empathy there. It's it's our motto. It's our kind of it's our DNA. It, it's in our it's in our DNA. Look, all I'm trying to say is that you know, vital a vital ingredient in all of this is the extraordinary way that teachers can engage students in deep processing through the way that they draw them in the way that they the way that they build in them uh, a love and an interest in what they're doing fantastic and uh, so on yeah and uh, and uh, so that's one thing and here's another thing this is a a, a, a lovely woman called amy uh, and Amy uh, is a professional, she's English, uh, she's a professional storyteller. That's what she does. She goes around the world telling stories and she tells them very well because that's what she does. And I have seen her on a number of occasions telling a story and at the end of her story, people rise up to their feet cheering because she's done it so well. She's fantastic, you know. Um, and and uh, how do I know about Amy? Well, I know about Amy because of a, a book I was involved in for Helbling with with a, a, an enormously good friend of mine and also someone who I admire professionally very much, a man called Herbert Puchter. And we wrote a book, uh, uh, we, we put together a book called Story-Based Language Teaching, and it's about storytelling and how important that is. And one of the points we wanted to make about stories is about content about content because if students if you can get students interested in a story the content of the language they're hearing will be so engaging and so interesting that they will be drawn into it almost whether they want to or not good content is the most important thing we can offer students good content interesting content and the moment that good content is involved students whether they like it or not start processing deeply heart and head emotion cognition so when amy that um, lovely woman you just saw when amy tells a story you just follow her you follow her into the story you can't help it you simply can't help it and that's absolutely fundamental so if you've got this wonderful connection yes exactly francisco the holy grail yes absolutely i love that expression that's really good um that that's kind of what i'm after a combination of great content deep processing and incredible teaching and creative and empathetic teaching and put all those together and we've got magic happening and that's all it takes and that's the secret of all language teaching and that's the end of my talk because now we know everything whoops uh, now we know everything oh wait a minute but 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 i'm going to introduce you to a very scary person. I'm going to intro introduce you to a little bit of a devil. Here is a devil. Uh, and um, <laughs> Alicia, Alicia says, says, yeah, uh, there's a devil uh, eating an English language student, obviously. Why they're naked, I, I don't know. But anyway, eating that they um, but but there we are. And what is the name of this devil? What is the name? Well, Alicia is very clever. She knows the name of this devil. The name of this devil is Exams. Ah! Look, look, look. Sorry, I, I'm just that was a really silly joke. Uh, but but let me let me let me be quite clear. Let me be quite clear. We all know why we have exams. Uh, there are good reasons for exams. Uh, they can, at their best, and with the right teaching, actually provide the kind of motivation and engagement we want. 
The danger with exams, and people always talk about the washback, the backwash effect and so on. The danger with exams is that they, is that they skew the balance. Because it seems to me that teaching is like walking on a tightrope between all of the lovely things we've talked about, the deep processing, the creativity, the empathy, the content, all of that beautiful stuff, and then the formal needs of, of the language, the, 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 the grammar, the vocabulary, the, the end of semester tests, the end of the month tests, and since we mentioned parents, pressure from parents for students to get good grades. Oh, and not just parents, what about the pressure of the school management to make sure that teachers are, you know, because teachers are often judged on whether, whether student exam results are good and so on and so forth. So there's a sort of tightrope that we walk on those two things. And that's a problem for us. Because it's very easy to get sentimental and emotional about deep processing and content and, and wonderful teachers. Everything I said up to now, I'm not being cynical, I believe profoundly in every single thing I've been saying. But if you like, that's the easy part. Uh, um, and this is the difficult part. And somehow we have to find a way of staying upright on that tightrope, which means, which means, uh, uh, well, it means this. This is a beautiful, beautiful tree. And it's a photograph that my friend and colleague Herbert Puchter found. Uh, isn't that just the most wondrous thing of nature? Just, it's just, just looking at it makes me kind of full of wonder. And the green and those branches and the, the, the roots, so many roots under the ground and so on and so forth. And it was thinking about this kind of tree, this kind of natural wonder, this kind of natural process that myself and Herbert came up with a metaphor which helped us to get through this conundrum, if you like, between those two worlds. Uh, um, uh, and we talk about root and branch and harvesting. Let me explain. When Amy tells a story, for some listeners, if they're students of English, the story is so engaging and the processing they do is so deep that if you were to ask them afterwards to tell the story again, they could do it using some of the language they've just heard, even sometimes when they've heard it for the first time. Some students are extraordinary like that. I should say some people are extraordinary like that. And you know very well, if you live in Romania, that some people come to Romania who don't speak Romanian, and some of them seem to pick it up so quickly because maybe they love it and they want to and they're motivated and they have good interactions and experiences. And other, other people who come and live in Romania or Mexico or Argentina or Angola or, or, or Austria or Germany or whatever, some people find it a lot more difficult. I don't know why. Actually, language learning is difficult. Let's not be, let's not, it's, it's only a few people who find it easy. For most people, learning a foreign language is very different, especially when you do it in classrooms. But if we're lucky when someone uh, like Amy tells a story in the magical way that she tells a story, for some people, that's almost enough. And you see this magic happening. Uh, and, 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 it's as if Amy has sowed a seed in the ground and it takes root and the branches branch out and the students suddenly branch out and start using the language and so on and so forth. But for other students, it's not like that.
for other students they need more help they um uh, um yes and um Elmila uh, says um uh, students have different language um uh, uh, and so on and so forth uh, and other students need more help uh, and that's where harvesting comes in and we'll talk about that in a minute so that's going to be our metaphor which will lead you through uh, the rest of this talk uh, uh, which will yes I'm, I better hurry up I've been I've been letting myself go on too long um, so I've been talking about storytelling so far, which is easy to talk about in a sense. But what about what about the second of the the sources of, of material for students, uh, texts and so on and so forth? Here we go. Uh, here's some material that, that I've been working on, uh, that we've been working on, myself and my co-authors. Um, so very straightforward. Off, here we go. Um, this is a question for you. Which do you like best, musicians or boxers? Which do you like best, musicians or boxers? Put it in the chat box. Let's see. Musicians, 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 musicians. Oh, poor boxers. One boxer. Musicians, 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 both musicians, boxers, boxers. Well, it's pretty clear what's going on here. Uh, musicians seem to be the winners. But some people like boxers as well, uh, because that's the way the world is. Why am I asking you this question? Well, you'll see in a minute. But I want you to notice something really important. Look at those words in red. You first. That is a statement, a pedagogical, methodological and empathetic statement uh, about what teaching is all about. Remember, I want some deep processing. I've got some content that I hope you'll be interested in. Uh, and I want to be the best teacher I can possibly be. And the first thing I'm going to do is to bring you, my darling students, into the room with me. Not just your bodies, not just your brains, but your hearts and your brains at the same time. You first. You first and in the middle and at the end. Because language learning is all about learning. It's not about teaching. Uh, so what I might ask you now is, OK, so you've just said you like musicians better than boxes. Why? explain yourself what what's what's going on say why or oh that's interesting you seem to be very keen on boxes why are you interested in boxes and we'll have a little chat about it and hopefully now your brains and your hearts are really open and ready for what's going to come and what's going to come is that i'm going to divide you uh, uh um i'm going to divide you into two groups group a and group b and Group A is going to read the following text from the top to the bottom. Hannah Rankin is a professional boxer from Scotland in her early 30s. In 2019, she managed to beat the American Sarah Curran and win the IBO Super Welterweight title, the first Scottish woman ever to have a world title. Now, I know that someone here, if they're still here, I caught it at the very, very beginning, said they were, they were attending from Scotland. So that's specially for you. Um, if you're if you're in Scotland. Uh, so she was the first Scottish woman ever to have a world title. Oh, dear. She didn't manage to keep the title when she fought Patricia Burgled in Malta a few months later, though. Well, hell, she's done pretty well so far. She's always enjoyed sports, but it was when her mother died that boxing became her number one interest. She says she was able to survive the sadness she felt then by going to the gym. That's what her father suggested, so she could switch off her emotions for a while. Well, uh, that's really interesting. She trains for a long time before a big fight, before her world title win. She couldn't see her fiancé for four weeks. That's ridiculous, you know. So that's the story about Hannah Rankin. Sounds like a rather an impressive young woman, you know. Uh, I'm not a boxer. I don't know very much about it. Um, and that's what Group A reads. Group B reads a different text, this time from the bottom to the top. And this is what Group B reads. Hannah Rankin is a professional musician in her early 30s. She's from a village in Scotland called Luss. She played the flute as a child, but in her teenage years, she changed to the bassoon. She studied at the Royal Conservatoire of Music in Edinburgh and has a master's degree from the Royal Academy of Music. 
Hannah plays in orchestras and is a music teacher. She plays in the wind quartet called Coriolis. As a bassoonist, she needs to protect her hands and her mouth, and so far she has managed to escape with just a couple of black eyes. And by now, when A and B compare what they've read, they'll realise something extraordinary. Both of these texts are talking about the same young woman. Because Hannah Rankin is not just a boxer, she's also a musician. And if you don't believe me, here she is. That's Hannah Rankin. And on the right is the lovely young woman who plays the bassoon. But that is also Hannah Rankin on the left, giving it some oomph. Totally different, hair all pulled back. Boxing gloves, a look of aggressive kind of competitiveness on her face. Isn't that extraordinary? And when I came across her, I couldn't believe it. And now, you see, look, I, some of you may be terribly bored, but my judgment from what's great, what's, what, what's, what's, um, what I'm seeing in the chat box is we've, it's sort of working. We've got the deep processing because we started thinking about musicians and boxers and things. And then what about the content? Well, this is irresistible. I mean, it's extraordinary, this woman, this young woman. She does both and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and, and there she is. Now, what does deep processing really mean? What does it really mean to plant a seed and have it grow into roots and then branch out? What does it mean? Well, it means letting your heart as well as your head get involved. So the most important thing I want to ask you, my dear students, is not how many examples can you find in the text of could and manage to. I'm going to ask you, what I think is a much more interesting question, and it's this. What would you like to ask or say if you met Hannah Rankin, and why? What would you like to ask her? Have a think about that for a minute. What would you like to ask her? What does what you've just heard make you think about? Uh, um, and and Kemal uh, Yuli says, "Well, she just, she, how do you how do you keep your hands safe? You know." And I'd say, I, "That's what I want to know. You can't. Play. I'm a musician. I play musical instruments. My hands, they're not very beautiful hands. It's, I can't do anything about that. That's how I was built. But they're terribly important to me. I'd hate it if they got smashed to pieces. What would I do? I've got guitars and double. It would be awful, you know. Um, what other questions would you like to ask her? Why? And what do you feel?" You sort of, a question that occurs to me is, if you're so used to being physically so powerful and pumped up and all that kind of thing, what does it feel like to sit quietly in an orchestra going boop, 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 boop. It's, it's a fantastic. Now, what I'm saying is, is everything we've done about Hannah so far is all about deep processing content, about teaching, about the way the teacher brings you this, this story, this content and so on and so forth. Uh, um, what do you feel when you hit and when you play? I, that's a really good question. Who asked that? That's, uh, that's Ines. Uh, um, uh, you know, what does it feel like to thump someone in the face? And, and what does it feel like to play a beautiful note? All of these things are so, so, uh, um, so profound. And I think we're all processing pretty deeply now. Heart and head, head and heart. Uh, and and that's sort of demonstrates so much of what I've been talking about. And if I'm lucky, you see, Yoskire, and if the student is that kind of a student, just everything we've done so far is almost enough for the student to absorb the language into their bloodstream, into their memory, into to love it, and so on and so forth. Uh, but you may not be that kind of lucky. Um, how can a sensitive person punch someone? That's a really interesting question. Um, you may not be that lucky. You may need help. You may need help to, do you remember the word, to disambiguate what's going on. And so if you, teaching materials, 
are obliged to offer that help, to allow students to harvest the language in the text, to harvest it, to gather it in, in the harvest, so that they can then use it as sustenance to build their English language. So we say things like this. We say, uh, um, look at these phrases. We, we could, was able to and managed to. Uh, she managed to beat the American Sarah Curran. She couldn't see her fiancé. She was able to survive the sadness. Let's see what, is there a difference between those? What's going on? What does the language mean? How does that work? Uh, um, we can, of course, not just confine it to, to uh, grammar. Uh, grammar is important, but there's a whole lot of other stuff going on. We can talk about some of the body metaphors uh, and, and allow students to branch out from that, if you like. Uh, uh, about you know what what are the, uh, the, the that's Carlos Acosta the dancer and things like that and then you can you know what parts of the body we do we use for these <coughs> idioms and things can you lend me a what I can't do this by myself can you help me uh, so that's can you lend me a hand he was pulling my he was pulling my what um, well it's leg obviously isn't it it always it always makes me laugh that in in England we, you pull someone's leg but in in Mexico and other Spanish-speaking countries, you're, you're jalando el pelo. It always makes me laugh. Why? Well, then I suppose it's why leg. I don't know. It's very strange. But at any rate, um, so, uh, and then we can get students to write their story. Something else we can do, by the way, just to mention it, uh, is, is we, can, we can say to students, well, look back at the two texts about Hannah Rankin uh, um, and uh, think of, three words or phrases that you'd most like to put into your suitcase and take home with you. Words that you like and you love and try to make them love words and phrases. Give them the opportunity to fall in love with words and phrases and by extension uh, to fall in love with English. Uh, let's be quite clear, not fall in love with the English, but to fall in love with English. Fall in love with the language. We all have the experience of loving a foreign language that we speak, a second, third or fourth language. It's lovely. It's like having an, 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 extra, an extra someone to love. It's beautiful, isn't it? And then, of course, what we can do, uh, and this brings us right back to the beginning of the talk, what we can do is say to them, why don't you find out more about women's boxing? When did it become an Olympic sport? Why did it become an Olympic sport? Was there any, uh, was there any, did they have to fight battles to make it um, an, an Olympic sport? Find out anything you can. Find out anything you can about Hannah Rankin. Just keep going, go looking. And then they're off, reading, hearing, seeing, um, uh, finding out, discussing in social media and so on and so forth. It, and, and suddenly everything we've talked about comes into focus. This walking the tightrope between the heart and the brain, between beautiful things and formal exam-like things, between all of those, marrying them together, walking the tightrope, keeping the heart and the head in balance. Um, so, these were the words we started out with, uh, and, and let's just quickly go through them and then we'll be finished. Uh, content. What we offer students is almost as important as what we do with it. And the danger is that sometimes we offer rather dry information about grammar and vocabulary and, and learning. But in reality, language is for feelings, for empathy, for love and hate and all of those kind of things. The content really matters. And that's why Amy, the woman I introduced you to, is so wonderful, because the content she offers is so good. I want my students to process deeply. Heart and head, head and heart. I want to plant seeds, which hopefully will allow them to branch out. I want them to have good interactions with people, uh, with each other, with, with uh, and so on and so forth. I want to help them to harvest the language, to gather it in, to give them sustenance. 
and of course we're going to do some focused language practice to help them and that's sort of all I wanted to say uh, and I guess I wanted to find out your reactions uh, uh, but that's very, very difficult because there are probably too many people for that. But I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so pleased that, that pe people are being really, really lovely. Uh, some, some, uh, it went past. Someone was asking me something about Mex de Sol. And, um, but, well, again, Sally, I love Mex de Sol. I haven't been there for too long. Um, last conference, where was it? I can't remember. But um, it, it's, it's just uh, lovely. And, and um, um, so I, I think I'd better, uh, I'd better end by thanking all of you who are still here for coming along it's it's uh, it's you, can, you can't imagine what a what a pleasure it is to see you here and I mean I know it's so difficult to talk to you individually but it's just it's just there's a lot of people here and it's an enormous honor and a privilege that you're here thank you very much for coming here and once again to reiterate my enormous uh, um, my enormous thanks to the Helbling team uh, and for all the incredible work they've done organizing these series.